While at first glance the scalp might seem rather innocuous, to the trained eye it is a fascinating layer cake of specialised tissues, each performing a unique but important function. Firstly, it sprouts hair that is important both aesthetically and as a heat insulator. It also provides a continuous cushion covering of the bony calvarium that protects it from trauma and infection and contains a connective tissue link between the important muscles in the front and the back of the head. Lastly, the scalp is also host to a rich anastomotic plexus of blood vessels, cutaneous nerves and lymphatics, as well as sweat and sebaceous glands. To the plastic surgeon, the scalp poses some unique challenges due to its anatomical features. This has made its anatomy a topic of hot discussion over the years, with some controversies persisting to this day. Let's dive into the anatomy of the scalp and see what we can learn. There's no great consensus on how the surface anatomy of the scalp should be defined, with bespoke systems existing for hair transplant surgeons, radiologists, neurosurgeons and the like. However, what is usually agreed upon are the anterior, posterior and lateral borders of the scalp. The most anterior border of the scalp is the supraorbital margin, where the frontalis muscle inserts into the orbicularis oculi and the skin over the eyebrow. Posteriorly, it's defined by the two occipitalis muscles insertion into the superior nuchal line. And laterally, it extends down to the zygomatic arch. The area bounded within this region is vast and has lots of variable anatomical features, but as mentioned, there isn't a great agreement on how to divide it up. However, key areas to be aware of are the vertex, which is the circular region on the back of the head where the wall of hair sits in men, the forehead, which spans between the hairline and the supraorbital ridge, and the temporal region, which sits on the lateral aspect of the head and roughly overlies the distribution of the temporalis muscle. The average scalp is five to six centimeters thick, and when cut can be divided into five structurally unique layers. Conveniently, we can remember these layers using the acronym SCALP. The most superficial layer of the scalp is the skin, this ranges in thickness from around 1 to 2 mm, with the thinnest overlying the vertex and the thickest just behind the ear. This layer is populated with sebaceous glands and is the hair-bearing part of the scalp. The next layer is a sheath of dense connective tissue, more properly known as the subcutaneous layer. This is the thickest part of the scalp, measuring around 2.5 mm, and is composed primarily of fat lobules, which are further divided into small compartments by tough fibrous septa. It is in this subcutaneous layer that the network of blood vessels and nerves form their superficial plexuses. Next is the epicranial aponeurosis layer, otherwise known as the Galea aponeurotica. This is the 1mm thick sheath of connective tissue that connects the anterior frontalis muscle to the posterior occipitalis. It allows these muscles to act in unison to tense the scalp. The Galea aponeurotica is very tightly adhered to the subcutaneous layer above it, but below it is a shallow, potential space known as the subgaleal plane. This space is what allows the galea to glide over the scalp when you apply traction to it. It's worth noting that the tension produced by the actions of the frontalis and occipitalis muscles on this layer mean the scalp has a tendency to gape open when you cut across it from left to right. Some older texts describe a muscle adjoining the temporalis fascia to the galea, but its clinical significance, and even existence, is uncertain. The fourth layer is a simple layer of fibro fatty tissue colloquially referred to as the loose connective tissue. It fills the subgaleal space and essentially functions to allow the scalp to glide, as mentioned previously. Finally, we have a dense, half millimeter thick sheath of variably arranged collagen fibers known as the pericranium. This serves a similar job to the periosteum that overlies the bones in the rest of the body. It covers the whole of the bony cranium below, but is only actually adhered to it at the suture lines. OK, that covers the five soft tissue layers of the scalp, but any respectable anatomist wouldn't stop there. Directly below the pericranium level is the bony skull, more properly known as the calvarium or cranial vault. It functions to protect the brain and provide a point of attachment for multiple key structures on its inner surface. The main bones of the calvarium are the frontal bone, the two parietal bones, occipital bone and two temporal bones. There's also a small contribution from the greater wing of the sphenoid bone. How these all articulate with one another 
is a lesson for another day. A feature unique to the bony calvarium is its cross-sectional structure. It's arranged like a sandwich, providing a tough scaffold to hold the head together, but allowing enough flexibility to bend and absorb compressive forces. The outermost layer is the cortical outer table, followed by a spongy marrow layer known as the diploe, and finally a slightly thinner inner cortical table. Deep to the inner table is the endosteal dura mater, which helps to enclose and protect the brain. Okay, now we're familiar with the layers of the scalp, let's look at its neurovascular supply. As mentioned earlier, the scalp receives blood in an anastomotic plexus of vessels, arising from five main arteries. These all begin inferiorly in the head and branch as they travel upwards towards the vertex. From the external carotid artery come three smaller divisions. These are the posterior auricular artery, which supplies the area behind the ear, the occipital artery, which emerges in the posterior scalp to supply a large region over the occiput, and the large superficial temporal artery, which divides into anterior and posterior branches to supply the temporal scalp. The remaining two arteries originate from the ophthalmic artery, which itself is a branch of the internal carotid. These are the supratrochlear artery and the supraorbital artery, which both supply parts of the forehead and frontal scalp. Although these arteries cross the midline in a few places, they're mostly unilateral. Most blood to the scalp comes from these five arteries, but there are also a minority of bone perforators that originate from the meningeal arteries inside the skull before travelling vertically upwards. The veins of the scalp follow a similar distribution to the arteries and are named correspondingly. The superficial temporal and posterior auricular veins contribute to the formation of the retromandibular vein. The supratrochlear and supraorbital contribute to the angular and eventually facial vein. And finally, the occipital vein drains into the suboccipital plexus. The cutaneous veins communicate directly with the veins of the diploe and dural venous sinuses via emissary and mastoid veins. The sensory innervation of the scalp is complex, and its details are beyond the scope of this session. Let's just take a look at the main nerves to be aware of. Anterior to the ears and vertex, all sensory innervation comes from the branches of the trigeminal nerve whilst the posterior scalp is supplied by branches from the C2 and C3 anterior and posterior rami. And there we go. That's the most important features of the anatomy of the scalp. We've got videos going over the nerves of the head and neck, as well as the bones forming the neuro and viscerocranium. So if you're in the mood for more learning, check out those next. Otherwise, I hope you learned something and have a great day. <laughs>